Jujutsu Kaisen is a Jujutsu Kaisen is a weird show. Ah! Oh! Ah! Ah! God! Ow! Uh, it, it hits this sweet spot between familiarity and novelty. And as easy as it is to trace its inspirations, the way it goes about exploring its world with this... Oh, hold on a second. The way it goes about exploring its world with this horror movie tone and the whiplash of its cast teenage angst and childlike joy makes even its most played out ideas feel fresh for me. If for nothing else than leaning into that adolescent perspective. So today, I want to talk about all the weird details of Jujutsu Kaisen and why I think they make it work so well. And I think it's best to start with some of the show's more technical details. For anyone who may not know, Jujutsu Kaisen is an anime series directed by Sung Hoo Park, produced by MAPPA, and based on the manga of the same name, by Gege Akutami, about Yuji Itadori, a shockingly strong high schooler who, shortly after the death of his grandfather, finds himself stumbling into monstrous manifestations of human negativity known as curses, and the hidden society of sorcerers dedicated to exorcising them, when he eats one of the fingers of Ryoman Sukuna, the king of curses. This turns him into a vessel for Sukuna's power, and thus a danger that must be executed immediately. However, after displaying some control over Sukuna's influence, his execution is delayed until he can eat all 20 of Sukuna's fingers so his death can rid the world of the king's presence all at once. In the meantime, he's enrolled into Jujutsu High, a training ground for young sorcerers where, with the guidance of the eccentric Satoru Gojo, and alongside fellow first years Megumi Fushiguro and Nobura Kugisaki, he learns all the ins and outs of this ghostly world while dark forces work in the shadows to rip it apart. And for as much as I'd like to just gush about the show, I find it hard to do wholeheartedly. I mean, sure, its presentation is absolutely stunning. Its action is exceptional both in its broad strokes and the moment-to-moment -moment beats of its choreography, something to be expected from the director behind God of High School, which, as lukewarm as I felt about its story, still has some of the best animated fights I've seen. The animation itself feels rough, with its scratchy smears and loose flow of its motion giving a grimy edge that complements the darker tone of its story. There's an incredible level of detail given to its backgrounds and environments, and the way it moves through them, letting the camera linger on these bustling paths and empty hallways to build up a true sense of place for moments both calm and horrifying, which we'll get back to later. Hell, even the fashion is fantastic, and personally, I can't help but respect how well it's able to imbue each of the characters' uniforms with a distinct personality. All the way from the casual to the delinquent-esque to the high street savvy to the formally minded, while still looking like it's all cut from the same cloth, so to speak. And don't even get me started on the OPs and EDs, man, because I'll be here all fucking day if I do. And the music? My god! And this is all before you even get to the characters themselves, who, more than being a collection of quirky traits, feel defined by their respective perspectives on and experiences with this world, for better and for worse. It makes it easier to connect with even the more one-note characters of the show, as it's able to clearly and concisely communicate how they understand their situation. Whether it be someone like Ichiji, a fumbling but professional assistant to the Jujutsu sorcerers who's painfully aware of his lack of cursed abilities, but is still willing to stand up to people to do what he thinks is right knowing it probably won't amount to much, or even villains who only show up for like an episode, like the two brothers near the end of the series whose whole shtick is that they live for each other. It gives a surprising amount of nuance to even its most throwaway characters, and I think this approach only helps their conflicts and dynamics, as it lets them come from natural differences between them, even for questions as seemingly simple as who they should save. The series takes time to flesh out its characters in a way that just feels genuine. But I think all this praise comes with some caveats. The series' pacing can feel weird at the best of times, and while for the most part I don't think it's too much of an issue, it becomes quite a pain to get through as it goes on, since I seem to have the controversial opinion that the Kyosho Goodwill event arc was... 
okay? Look, there were some cool moments, the baseball was great, but they were just faffing about for eight episodes, and you know I'm right! I think a big part of it comes from the show's reliance on exposition, which, while sometimes cool, especially given the way it's written itself a clever out to let characters ramble, since in-world, revealing one's techniques and powers makes them stronger, it just as often dives into long-winded monologues and just completely unnecessary comments. <laughs> Yeah, no shit. And for as stellar as the animation usually is, I think it's also let down sometimes by how slippery everything looks. To be fair, I do think the jank of it can add to the rough aesthetic of the show in a weird way, but I'd be lying if I said it never gets to me sometimes. <laughs> but I think the biggest thing that can make or break the show for someone is just how much it wears its influences on its sleeve. I'm not a big shonen guy, but even I get sent for a loop sometimes by the Naruto-esque dynamic of its main crew, and the bleach-like vibes of its ghost-hunting sorcerer society hidden in plain sight. And I can I can easily understand why for some, that's all they'd be able to see it as, cause it is not that subtle. Though, personally, I don't think it's bound by these influences, as it does feel like it does a lot to play around with those tropes and establish its own identity. Like, being the kind of show to build its main character's training arc around concentrating while watching movies, or having a man basing his opinion of others on the kind of women slash men they like, and upon hearing someone has the same taste as he does, envisions an entire high school AU backstory where they're childhood friends, and who comforts him after getting rejected by his favorite idol, who was also a student there for some reason. <laughs> But is it the best shonen? Man, I don't fucking know, and honestly I don't fucking care, I just think it's a cool show. Why does liking things have to be treated like a fucking tournament? Besides, how would you even objectively measure something like that? By how epic I think it is? Duh! Oh my fucking god. And this is all before you get to the situation with the studio behind it, which to me seems like a microcosm of the issues running rampant across the anime industry. Granted, I've talked about this kind of thing in a lot more detail before, and the Canopy Effect recently made a great video going into much more depth with MAPPA specifically, which I'd highly recommend checking out if you want a deeper dive into it. So to keep it short for this video, despite originally being a studio that was, and still to an extent is, known for making the kinds of weird shows no one else would, one that was established to step away from the corporatized environment that dominated the former studio, Madhouse, of its founder, Masao Maruyama. It's one that, following its sudden popularity following Yuri on Ice, it seems to have ironically fallen back into, as it's taken on more shows than it can handle and forced its already slim animation staff to stretch even thinner, leading to it relying heavily on outsourcing to get things done. And looking at the varying quality of MAPPA's series over the years, I think it's clear to see which ones they've banked their money on and which ones they've left out in the cold. One animator has even spoken out about MAPPA's practices, criticizing it for being so focused on production that it's unable to properly train new staff, and comparing their work environment to a factory. While MAPPA's situation is nothing unique in the anime industry, I think it's emblematic of its biggest problems, as the companies running it seem more concerned about how many products it can put out rather than the well-being of the people who make them. For as much credit as I can give to the staff behind Jujutsu Kaisen on an individual level, I'm hesitant to say anything positive about the studio organizing them. Jujutsu Kaisen is an ambitious show, and for as much as there is to gush about, I feel like it comes at a cost, as my enjoyment is constantly couched between caveats about its occasional struggle to reach the heights it's aiming for, and the conditions those making it are wading through, haunting my thoughts on it like a ghost. Which, in a way, is fitting, given the tone of its story. As someone who's been obsessed with horror for as long as I can remember, I think the biggest draw of Jujutsu Kaisen for me comes from its macabre elements. Mixing horror and action isn't a new concept. Hell, just when looking at recent anime, it's clear to see the trend Jujutsu Kaisen is following, with things like Attack on Titan and the Promised Neverland centering their fantasy adventures around the existential dread of a world where humans no longer live at the top of the food chain, or Demon Slayer integrating supernatural Japanese folklore into a traditional battle anime format. And it's probably something that's gonna reach new heights when Chainsaw Man gets animated, cause fucking hell, have you read this shit? 
This is just the first fucking chapter, Jesus Christ! And Jujutsu Kaisen leans just as heavily into the genre. I've talked about my thoughts on how one can achieve a true sense of horror in 2D animation before, and I think Jujutsu Kaisen hits the nail on the head of nearly every point. There's some strong direction throughout, framing its horror in darkly lit rooms with only a few sources of moody, unnatural light, and taking time to build tension, its camera lingering on long, quiet wide shots, the ambiance humming away ominously, leaving the audience unsure of the surroundings they're immersed in, and holding on tight close-ups to leave the characters unaware of what's lurking in the shadows until it's too late. And the monstrosities waiting there are truly frightening, with designs that are just downright uncomfortable to watch. Caught in this uncanny valley of familiarity and incomprehension that's heightened by the unnerving detail with which they're rendered, their line work and shading implying so much grotesque tangibility to the many folds and crevices riddling their misshapen bodies, and the literal texture overlaid across their forms just emphasizing how unnatural they are in contrast to the simple cell shading of the rest of the show. Even something as simple as the high-pitched filter their screams are processed through, meme as it is, just chills me to the bone. Oh. Jujutsu Kaisen does everything it can to create a sense of dread and disgust in its darker moments. But what I find interesting about it is the way it seems to tie this horror specifically to its characters' younger perspectives. It takes the power fantasy of a secret world of magic so many kids dream of adventuring through and upends it, showing how scary such a world could really be, and emphasizing just how useless one would be in it, as it not only emphasizes how dangerous being a Jujutsu sorcerer is, it kills off one of Fushiguro's good boys, leaves Nobra on the verge of consumption, slices off Ichidori's hand, blasts off the fingers on the other, and kills him, if only temporarily, after Sukuna holds Itadori's body hostage by ripping his heart out. <laughs> Hell, Itadori's greatest strength comes not from himself, but by giving up control to Sukuna. Sukuna's raw power naturally breaches well outside Itadori's physical form without him even realizing it, and his manipulative tendencies leave Itadori walking on eggshells, as his revival comes at the cost of making a pact with Sukuna that he can't even remember. <laughs> And while Sukuna's influence admittedly only plays a general role in the second half of the series, which arguably undermines this point as Itadori actually does get some straight up power ups during that arc, it's something that comes back into play big time in what would be season 2 material from the manga that I learned of thanks to the internet fucking spoiling it on me, so thanks for that, Twitter, you fucking asshole. Itadori is a big fish in a little pond that's been thrown into the vast ocean that is Jujutsu's sorcery, and he's nothing compared to the monsters lurking beneath its waves. More than anything else, the series emphasizes how powerless one would be in this kind of classic adventure scenario. And it's not just the main cast that does this for, as it also ups the ante for those just living in this world generally. The most horrifying examples of its cruelty happen to those who get caught in the crossfire, as friends and strangers alike are attacked, ripped to pieces, or burnt to a crisp just for the fuck of it. In some cases, it doesn't end with their death, as it reveals how some of the curses the characters face aren't purely metaphysical manifestations, but ordinary people who've been kidnapped and twisted beyond recognition, either through direct possession or purposeful manipulation, the last remnants of conscious thought they had before losing their very sense of self echoing out in pain. For as high as the stakes can be for Jujutsu Kaisen's main characters, it emphasizes the damage that can be done to the passers-by who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and as a result makes the risks that come with losing that much more impactful for its characters, because it's no longer just themselves they have to worry about. And what I think makes this focus on a young person's perspective more terrifying is how it turns what should be a coming-of-age story into a nightmare, something I think is embodied by Junpei. 
He's a timid but caring high school kid who's bullied relentlessly in a school that does little to stop his torment. But one day he meets Mahito, a curse who transforms some of the bullies who tortured him and quickly becomes close friends. Mahito seems to be the only person who understands Junpei's hatred of the people around him, and the only person outside of his mam who treats him with any sort of kindness. And when his mam is killed by a curse drawn to their home by a rogue finger of Sukuna, Mahito shows him how to use cursed energy to get revenge on the person he believes he might have done it. Junpei's experienced the absolute depths of this world's cruelty, and it's left him believing that no one deserves to be saved, especially not those who've gone so far out of their way to hurt him. But for Junpei, the problem doesn't lie in the pain they caused, it lies in the horror of recognizing that there might be more to them than the pain they inflicted. <laughs> What makes it worse is the fact that the person who left that Sukuna finger behind was Mahito, the one person Junpei thought he could trust, just to see if he could somehow force Itadori to let Sukuna come out and fight. While the circumstances are generally very different, it's a horrifying reality I think every kid eventually has to come to terms with, as they realize that even the worst of people are just as full of life and humanity and hardships as they are, and that even the nicest of people are just as capable of cruelty and manipulation as anyone else, and how difficult it can be to distinguish the two. It's this specific through line that makes Jujutsu Kaisen's horror so interesting to me, because more than simply making it spooky, tying its scares to its character's adolescent experiences lets it build itself around the horror of growing up, as these bright-eyed kids come to terms with just how terrifyingly huge and cruel the real world actually is. And nowhere is that more clear than in the realizations they have about the things they've grown up with. <laughs> I think one of the more interesting through lines of Jujutsu Kaisen is its skepticism of the institutions and traditions that run its world, something I think is pretty fitting for a series centered around a cast of teenage characters. In almost every case, they're depicted as vaguely antagonistic or actively villainous. The higher-ups of Jujutsu High go out of their way to preemptively kill Itadori, either assigning him and his friends to missions beyond their capabilities, assigning the Kyoto students with killing him in the middle of the Goodwill event and calling it an accident, or training the curse they're meant to exercise for it to specifically hunt him down. The teacher at Junpei School is shown to be deeply gullible with how easily he misunderstands the relationship between Junpei and his bullies. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the series focuses so much of this around educational institutions, since I don't think it's too much of a stretch to argue that most people's first proper experiences with such highly structured institutions comes from school, with all its rigid schedules and arguably arbitrary rules about respectability and uniforms and homework. Home is for video games and sometimes sleep, not geometry. The fuck is this bullshit? And maybe this is just the places I went to, but school is also, as they grow up, one of the first places kids tend to direct their rebellious ire as they reach teenagehood. Hell, even the big curses of the series in a way represent this traditional power in themselves, with them all being ancient embodiments of humanity's oldest fears, some of the oldest ideas we've ever had, from which many of our oldest traditions sprung from, and all of which are more than happy to remind us why we should still be afraid. It's those who embody or are aligned with this world's oldest institutions and traditions the show seems to have the biggest problem with. Part of it comes from the apathy with which so many of them operate. Junpei School seems to do little to address the rampant bullying and harassment faced by its students, not just with Junpei and his friends, but generally. <laughs> Go, 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 go
And as mentioned, some of its staff seem to be actively mistaken or confused about what's actually going on, while some students turn the other way when they see it happen. It's no wonder then that having been failed by them, it was so easy for Junpei to be led down such a dark path by someone who offered him a chance to take back some agency in his life. It emphasizes how arguably useless some institutions are in addressing the issues running rampant in them. And for some of them, that may be the point, as part of their structure requires them to actively put down those lower down its rungs. Jujutsu society is one that seems dominated by old-fashioned traditions and cruel disregard for those it sees as lesser, whether it be with how Kamo's clan exiled his mother, <laughs> Or how Fushiguro's parents sold him off to the Zenin clan and ran away. But the depth of it became clear for me in episode 17, as it explores the backstory and relationship between the twin sisters Mai and Maki, and their mistreatment by the Zenin clan. Aside from the belief of twins being a bad omen, they were both born without the cursed techniques the clan prides itself on and very little cursed energy, or in Maki's case, literally none. And being women, they were expected to keep quiet and serve the family as best they could. However, Maki was born with incredible physical strength, and her skills with cursed tools are unrivaled. But it's something the Zenin clan actively looks down upon. So when she left the clan to spite them, the clan started to take it out on Mai, who was forced to become a Jujutsu sorcerer to avoid it as much as she could. And rather than recognize how harshly they've treated her, she instead blames her sister both for standing up for herself and for leaving Mai behind to deal with the aftermath. <laughs> And it's not just limited to Jujutsu society, as the series also emphasizes how the old-fashioned mentalities normal people can have can be just as destructive as anything else. With how quick and intense the harassment Nobara's neighbor faced when she moved into her countryside town for being a city girl ended up being... <laughs> And how callously Nanami's old boss encourages employees to prioritize profit above anything else. Of course. Some institutions' dedication to the old ways, for as idealistic as it may seem, is simply a way for them to weaponize those traditions to reinforce their own authority. And in some cases, that desire for control is an actively destructive influence, as seen with the curse's organized efforts. Granted, it might be a bit of a stretch to talk about this loosely connected group in the same way as an organized institution, but as mentioned before, I do think they in themselves can be seen as representing the old fears said institutions are built on avoiding. And what's more, their whole plan revolves around wiping out humanity to establish a world ruled by other curses like themselves, by awakening Sukuna's full form the long-dead king of curses himself. They're essentially seeking to create a world run by a literal representation of the ancient past, and are willing to do anything to get it done. And this is all before you even take into consideration just how deeply unfair the hierarchies these institutions and traditions are built around. The power system of Jujutsu Kaisen is one that relies in large part on luck, with cursed techniques and heavenly pacts being things you're born with, with no real guarantee of being able to inherit one regardless of the family you're born to, whether it be the unbelievable strength and power of Gojo's literal infinity, or the deeply cruel heavenly pact forced onto Kokichi Muta, aka Mekamaru, who, in exchange for the incredible range over which he can use his cursed energy, was born without a right arm, no feeling below his waist, and skin so sensitive that even soft light burns. And I just think it's ironic, really, given how much those higher-ups in its organizational structure talk about the need for order, when the very basis for their power is defined by the most chaotic stroke of luck one could imagine. But there is a silver lining to it all. Even if it's too late to save Junpei, his school does eventually take charge in addressing the issues that pushed him down that path in the first place, and the people who led him there. <laughs> Yoshino Kokoro Kurusta Simio, Isho Seo Teki Tekunda. 
and the series seems to have an optimistic hope for the future, in the potential its young characters have of being able to make things better themselves. Hell, some of these characters even see the power of Jujutsu itself, random as it can be, as a way to right the wrongs of this unfair world. Just as Jujutsu Kaisen's horror stems from the adolescent fear of growing up, I think its understanding of its world is just as defined by that younger mentality, as its teenage characters become increasingly aware of the arbitrarily authoritative nature of its structure, and the rebellious spirit that comes with going out of their way to challenge and change them even if they die trying. Which is what I think makes their individual struggles through it that much more compelling, as they each deal with… For as much focus as there is on death throughout Jujutsu Kaisen, the main through line that defines the story for me is the difficulty many find in living their life. Regret is a constant presence throughout the series. It constantly hammers home the idea of curses being born out of human negativity, with regret itself being emphasized above all. <laughs> The principal of Jujutsu text Tokyo School warns Itadori of the dangers of tying his motivations to someone else near the start of the series. And explains his concerns about pushing his students too hard when they're still so young. And more to the point, almost all of the characters are, in their own way, working to avoid the fallout of failing to achieve something. Nobra wants to escape the suffocating culture of the town she grew up in before it gets to her. Kama wants to become a good leader for his clan, both for its sake and his mother. Nanami wants to feel like the work he does is worthwhile, that it actually adds to people's lives, instead of the mindless tedium he felt was destroying him when he worked as a salaryman. They range from things as simple as Toto not wanting to hang out with boring people or miss out on meeting his favorite idol to things as relatable as Miwa just wanting to support her family, to things as complicated as Maki wanting to make something of her life. And I think the show's hyperfixation on the idea of death only adds to this, because for many of these characters, failing to achieve these goals would be the same as dying. Jujutsu Kaisen's characters are all, in one way or another, defined by this intense desire not so much to succeed, but to just not fuck up. It's an especially poignant detail for Itadori. His journey is defined by two things. To live up to his granddad's dying wishes, to use his strength to help people, die surrounded by people, and to ensure they and he have a proper death, and from his own inability to live with himself if, given the chance to help, he did nothing. <laughs> However, he quickly finds himself running into hurdle after hurdle to achieve that, as he realizes he's not strong enough to fight the monsters of this world, failing to save Junpei before Mahito's manipulation got the better of him, and being forced to kill what used to be people to save the day from the curses that broke them not once, but twice. Despite trying his best, Itadori is forced to come to terms with the fact that effort and determination sometimes just aren't enough to succeed without something being lost. 
Meanwhile, Fushiguro seems to have the exact opposite problem. His enemies tend to notice potential, and some go as far as to scold him for not using it. <laughs> However, as the series goes on, it starts to become increasingly clear that Fushiguro's refusal to embrace his potential comes both from a simple lack of confidence in those abilities, with him being surrounded by so many stellar sorcerers with much more powerful skills and techniques, and his own willingness to sacrifice himself for the sake of victory, even on the smallest of scales. For as noble as Fushiguro's mentality is, it holds him back from reaching his full strength, since his refusal to fail at any cost stops him from being able to learn from any mistake he might make. And I think that's sort of the point to it all. Granted, given the series is only one season in, it's hard to come to a definitive conclusion about what the point of its story actually is, but for this season at least, I think it's clear to see its focus on encouraging people to just live their lives. There will always be some risk to anything you do, but they'll always be worth it. Even if you fail, at best you'll just have to try again, and at worst it'll be something you can learn from. It's an especially fitting through line for a show focused on teenagers, for whom every moment can feel like the be-all end-all of life, as they've hit the point when they've just gotten old enough to explore the world with relative freedom, and just before they get bogged down by the full weight and responsibilities of a adult life and the working world. At the end of the day, I think Jujutsu Kaisen is very simply trying to say that you should try your best to live your life as best you can in spite of the risks that come with it. Because there's no greater regret anyone could have than to leave this world without a life well lived. For as many weird creative choices as Jujutsu Kaisen makes, I think the strangest thing of all about it for me is how, under all those layers of grotesque horror, societal commentary, and tongue-in-cheek humor, it tells a classic coming-of-age story. As these teenage characters come to terms with the horrifying and frustrating realities of the world around them, and fight to make their world a better place in whatever ways they can. And there's something about the joy with which it does so that I just can't help but appreciate. And yeah, those are my thoughts. I gotta say, I am still pretty damn salty about getting spoiled on this show, but it does at least make me excited to see what a second season will bring. Also, this ended up stretching out much longer than I expected. It's been a while since I've done a properly big ol' fuck off kind of video, and I'm starting to remember why I have such a love-hate relationship with these things. It does not help that the weather has just turned the room I fucking record them in into a fucking furnace that I'm just sort of stuck in for like half an hour while I record all this shit. There was even a bunch of stuff I ended up having to cut or didn't get to mention because it was just too much, and I didn't think I'd be able to get the research done to talk about it properly, like a broader discussion of shonen battle anime and Jujutsu Kaisen's place in it, or a more detailed deep dive into its depiction of women and so on, though they are the kind of things that I feel could turn into their own videos later on, so there's that at least. Anyway, hope yours are staying safe, keeping your distance, washing your hands, wearing a mask, getting vaccinated if you can, etc, and let me know what you think. If you agree, disagree, who your favourite characters of the show are, Nobra and Gojo or my personal favorites, if you're excited for the Jujutsu Kaisen Zero movie, etc, and thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this and want to see more, then check out my last video, where I talk about all the tragedies in and around Stars Align, or watch me ramble about my top things of winter 2021. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe to come fly with me. Hit the bell, stay notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, and poor attempts at humor, follow me on Instagram for semi-regular art stuff, and hopefully I'll see you- ah fuck my finger, and hopefully I'll see you later.